During this pandemic, we are seeing things that are unimaginable, right? <laughs> and as a person of color, I'm seeing things I never thought I would see. I never thought me and two black friends walking into a bank would be told to put on a mask. <laughs> Black people, you get it, right? You want me to put that on and go in there? I never thought I would see that. You know what that's like? That's like two black people winning the cornhole championship of the world. You see how the black people didn't laugh? Because they don't know what the hell cornhole is. I never thought a furniture store could be racist during a pandemic. Now, we just celebrated Juneteenth. It's a national holiday. It's on the calendar now, and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful situation. Now, if you don't know what it means, it means it's the emancipation of the last black American slaves. Yeah. But one Ikea store, they wanted to celebrate too. This is a true story, look it up when you leave. <laughs> On Juneteenth, they serve chicken and watermelon. <laughs> I was just like, y'all, I was mad. I got offended, you know? Because when I got there, they were out of watermelon. I was like, this is what? I never thought I would almost die from coronavirus. March 17th of last year, I woke up gasping for air. It's so new, less than 100 people died from it. My wife calls 911. The operator has to look it up, a black lady named Teresa. She goes, ooh, it could be COVID. He could be contagious. Then there's a long pause on the phone. Then she says, girl, you better get away from him. <laughs> My wife goes, what I do? She says, put him in the front yard. I'm like, <laughs> like I'm trash? <laughs> My wife looks at me and goes, you got to go. <laughs> but I'm a man, I'm like, hell no, I'm staying in my house. I ain't going no front yard. So now I'm sitting in the front yard. <laughs> Gasping for air. The ambulance comes, they put oxygen on me. They say, say goodbye to your family. Now, I can't touch my family because I got COVID, right? So my wife is at the front door with my son and a window separates us. They're crying, I'm crying. So I walk up to the window and put my hand on it where my son is, gasping for air. <gasps> my three-year-old son puts his hand on top of my hand looks at me and goes, <laughs> this little motherfucker making fun of me, man. <laughs> Fuck you, dude. <laughs> but the comedian in me was like, his timing's incredible. <laughs> So they put me in an ambulance. Now, if you've never been in an ambulance, it's a scary ride. You don't know what's gonna happen on the other side, right? And they put your neck in a brace, so all you can do is look up. And while I'm looking up at the ceiling, I'm going, you know what, they should put some motivational quotes up here or something. <laughs> something to put you at ease, you know what I mean? Like, you only live once. <laughs> Enjoy the ride. <laughs> OJ did it. So I get to the hospital. Lots of doctors and nurses waiting on me, and this is when I found out something interesting. The guy that rolled me out of the ambulance was like, you're our first COVID patient. Good luck. <laughs> so they send me into a room. They take every blood test, every x-ray they could, right? Then they leave the room. About 30 minutes later, I see all the doctors in front of my room in a window, right? And they're just talking like <laughs> And then I see him draw straws and one goes, fuck!
and that dude walks in. <laughs> He's scared. He told me less than 100 people died from COVID. So it was new, and he was like nervous, and he goes, well, uh, here's what's happening. Your lungs are filling up with fluid, and you have double pneumonia and corona. So I look at the doctor and go, what's that mean? He goes, well, it's gonna go really good, or really bad. <laughs> And we'll know in about two days. <laughs> and then it start to sink in. I go, whoa, 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 this is serious. I'm gonna make it, right? He looks me straight in the eye and goes, we'll try our best. <laughs> Yo! <laughs> you always want people to try their best, right? <laughs> but you never want someone to tell you <laughs> they're trying their best. You ever drop your car off to a mechanic, pick it up, and you're like, hey man, did you fix my brakes? And the dude's like, yeah, you know what, we tried our best. <laughs> So they put me in ICU. I'm the only person in ICU. It's new. It's new. Now, this is the only thing I'm going to say about vaccines. I don't care if you're on them or not on them. I'm not going to tell you what to do with your body. But if you're not on them, please do not say, I don't want to get the shot because I don't want to be a guinea pig. You're not a guinea pig. You know how I know this? Because I was a guinea pig. Because <laughs> the doctor walked into my room and went, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> so we got to give you everything. And they did. I was like a whore and the drugs were like dicks and I was just taking them all in the mouth. I got gang banged by experimental drugs. The first one they gave me, hydroxychloroquine. I had an allergic reaction to it. My temperature shot up to 104.8, almost died that night. But this is the last thing you ever want to hear your doctor say as he leaves the room. He saved my life, he's leaving the room. He looks back at me and goes, man, we learned something new today. <laughs> now, as I'm dying in the hospital, I'm watching TV. And there's a group of people on TV saying it's a hoax. Now, you know what these people look like. <laughs> I don't have to describe them to you. <laughs> if a Cracker Barrel exploded <laughs> and landed on a Walmart <laughs> and drove off in an F-150, So they were supposed to tell me if I was gonna live or die in two days, it took them four days, right? The doctor said, you're doing so well, we're actually gonna let you go on the fifth day. So on the fifth day, I'm getting ready. I'm putting on all my clothes. All the doctors run into my room and go, no, 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 lay back down, lay back down, lay back down, you can't leave. I go, what's the matter, doc, what's the matter? He goes, oh man, we just let somebody go home and they died. I was like, shit. <laughs> you can keep me in this bitch forever. I'm not going anywhere, you know? Put me at the front desk, I'll answer phones, I don't care. <laughs> what was happening is they were letting people go home, they would relapse and couldn't make it back to the hospital. If they did make it back to the hospital, it was too packed and they couldn't take them, right? So they evaluated me for three more days. Now remember, it's still new. So on the eighth day, they're letting me out of the hospital, out of ICU. Doctor looks at me, we're at the exit, me and the doc. He looks at me and goes, hey man, you need to quarantine. I go, how long? He goes, uh, hmm, 22 days? Cool, I'm at home for 22 days quarantine. Let me tell you what my beautiful wife is going through. She's alone, we have a three-year-old son and a two-month-old daughter. So for 22 days, I'm hearing my kids yell, scream, my son's asking where daddy is, my wife is losing her mind, I'm getting breakfast, lunch, and dinner delivered to my room. I'm like, damn, COVID ain't that bad. I feel like a husband in the 50s, you know what I mean? I'm like, get those kids away from me. Bitch, where's my dinner?
<laughs> but I gotta say, man, I gotta say, to all the doctors, nurses, frontline workers that are here tonight, thank you for what you do. You are the real heroes. Yeah. Yep. So, I became good friends with my doctor, uh, of course, because he saved my life, right? And they test my blood all the time because I was one of the first patients that beat COVID that they didn't put on a ventilator. So the doctor calls me up for a uh, blood test to see if I need a booster or not. And he goes, well, here's your results. If your level is over 20, you don't need a booster. If your level is under 20, you need a booster. I go, all right, doc, what's my level? He goes, your level is 25, 100. <laughs> you have 120 times more antibodies than you need. The highest number I've ever seen during this pandemic is 700, and your level is 2,500. That's right. I hung up the phone, looked at my wife, and said, I'm a goddamn superhero. I'm the half Black Panther. Do you realize I could sneeze on someone and cure them? Shake my hand, sir. <laughs> You're vaccinated. <laughs> Fist bump. Booster! <laughs> I'm not gonna lie to you, I got too cocky after the doctor told me this. I got way too cocky, way too cocky. I was doing everything I wasn't supposed to do. Yeah, I was going out, touching everything. I was opening doors for everybody. <laughs> Did not care. I opened the door for a little old lady. She was like, do you need some hand sanitizer? I was like, oh, hell no. <laughs> I am hand sanitizer. <laughs> I lived a life without fear. Everything I was afraid of, had no fear of anymore. A cop pulled me over, was like, do you know why I stopped you? I was like, no, bitch, and just drove off. I was like, what? <laughs> this is what it feels like to be white, what? I didn't do that. Uh-uh, I'm still half black. I ain't doing that to a cop. Oh, hell no. But when you debate your life, when you go back and forth in your life, you don't know if you're gonna live or die. You realize a lot of things, great things that happen in your life and terrible things that happen in your life. And one thing that stood out to me is my parents never told me they loved me till I was 29 years old. And it really messed with me in the hospital, right? So before I get into that story, I gotta tell you about my parents. If you haven't seen my last special, my dad is black, born and raised in Louisiana, has a PhD in nuclear physics and served our country in the army, people. <laughs> right. Now, in the last special, he was 75, now he's 78 and he hasn't changed. He's still black and has swag. He still walks around the house like this, you know what I mean? And he's always laughing like, yeah, 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 yeah. And always pointing at random shit that's not there. Just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now my mom, she was born and raised in Korea, South Side. Now we know who doesn't watch the news in this room. I said it in my last special, Blasian. It's tough having an Asian mom because if they think it, they say it, they have no filter. My mom just turned 70 and now all bets are off. She does not care. I never thought my mom could be worse. My mom won't even say people's names to me anymore because she would rather describe them to me. She calls me the other day and goes, you know what, I like your friend, he nice. I go, which one? She goes, fat boy, small feet. <laughs> But I knew exactly who she was talking about. <laughs> because with my mom, my mom will say things that make you mad. She will say things that make you want to fight. But my mom feels, really feels that she can say anything to anybody. Because it's a true, it's a true. <laughs> oh, you don't like true? <laughs> oh, why you mad? It's a true. <laughs> Do I lie? Do I lie? <laughs> my mom got in a fight with my wife. 
Now, full transparency, my wife cooks like once every couple of, you know, once a, once. <laughs> so my mom walks into our new house and goes, oh, what a beautiful kitchen for no cooking. <laughs> Go, mom, you can't say that in my house. No, uh not to my wife. She goes, why? It's a chair, it's a chair. <laughs> you don't like chair. And then to me and my wife, she goes, do I lie? <laughs> do I lie? I look at my dad for help. He's like, walk away, son, walk away. <laughs> My wife, she's white. Ooh, it got quiet, okay. <laughs> but my wife is just not white. She white, white. <laughs> now, I know a lot of people in here are white, and you're questioning yourselves right now, going, am I white, white? <laughs> no. My wife is whiter than you. My wife is from Gillette, Wyoming, white. You hear that? When white people and Timmy like, damn. That's white. But we got a beautiful family, man. We got two kids. My son is now five, my daughter's two. And they're black, white, and Asian. That's right, that's right. We gave birth to pandas. We call them Ling Ling and Sing Sing. And my last special, I talk about this, when my son was born, because I didn't have a daughter at that time, when my son was born and the doctor handed me my son. It's crazy as a father, because I knew I would die for him, right? And I don't even know this dude. <laughs> he could be a terrible human being, but I would die for him, you know? But when they handed me my daughter, oh, it was different. I was like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I would kill for you. <laughs> I became a murderer overnight. Because <laughs> the family dynamic to me is crazy. Like, I would die for my son. I would kill for my daughter. But here's what's crazy. I wouldn't kill for my wife. Because <laughs> that's not my job. That's her father's job. I don't want to step on anybody's toes. because I love both of my kids the same, but the love is in different directions. My son, I want him to be able to take care of himself, be strong, but I know for the rest of my life, I'm going to protect my daughter, 100%. And what's the biggest threat to women? Men. Look at that, men. <laughs> so now I hate all men. <laughs> I became a lesbian activist overnight. <laughs> Slash murderer. I'm Ellen DeGeneres with a gun. <laughs> because every man's a threat to my daughter. Every single man eventually will be a threat to my daughter. I hate my son. Sometimes I hate my son. Why? Because he's a threat to my daughter. <laughs> we all have baby cams and watching my kids play. My daughter's playing with her little toy. My son walks over and grabs the toy from her. I get so angry, but then my daughter grabs it back and I'm like, yeah, that's my baby girl. <laughs> Right, don't take no man's crap. <laughs> but then my son looks around to see if anybody's watching. <laughs> Starts backing up where she is and he hits her with his butt. <laughs> and she falls to the ground and starts crying. I get so angry inside. I'm so mad, I wanna fuck this little dude up, right? <laughs> but I can't, he's only five and it's not a fair fight. It's not a fair fight. <laughs> All I can do is scream and like, hey! You better stop that. And he runs off. But my daughter could hit my son with a brick in the face. I'd be like, hey girl. Good job, good job. Because a daughter makes you a better man. 100%, 100%. It makes you more empathetic. You care about people. You get sensitive. I cry all the time now. All the time. I don't even know why my wife 
looks at me in disgust I cry so much. She's like, why are you crying? I'm like, I don't know. I've never seen my dad cry once, but I cry all the time. And then it hit me. Every generation of father gets softer and softer and softer. It means things are getting easier. My black grandfather was born in 1902 in America. Went through injustices you couldn't even imagine. My dad went through segregation, still got a PhD in nuclear physics, and had to march, had to march, just to drink out of the same water fountains as everybody else. That's right. Me? I would never drink out of a fountain. That shit's disgusting. But my dad, man, I can't take him to the park because he has to drink out of every freaking fountain. I'm like, you fought for this? He's like, I deserve this, son. I deserve it. tell you, man. I'm going on six years of marriage, man. My, my parents, though, they just celebrated 48 years of marriage. That's something to clap about. So I asked my dad, I said, hey, man, uh, you've been married 48 years. How'd you do it? How do you stay married that long? My dad looks at me and goes, that's simple, son. Never say the first or second thing that pops into your head. <laughs> You always say the third. I go, what's that mean? He goes, well, the first thing, you will get a divorce. The second thing, you are on the couch. But the third thing, happily ever after. I'm six years in, I don't get it, till about a month ago. Me and my wife are driving to Vegas. She packs a cooler of food for our two-year-old daughter. We get to Vegas. My wife opens up the cooler and goes, oh my God, the food all melted. I look in the cooler and notice she didn't put any ice in it. <laughs> you. I manned up though, you know, hey baby, you, you, you. you didn't put any ice in a cooler. My wife looks at me and goes, you don't need to put ice in a cooler. It's a cooler, duh. <laughs> now the first thing I thought was, that's the dumbest shit I ever heard in my life. But I didn't say the first thing, I didn't say the second thing, I said the third thing. I said, baby, I can't believe this cooler. <laughs> is broken. So, I kind of got off course. I was supposed to tell you why my parents never told me they loved me. So when I finally get well, it took me eight months, nine months to get well, right? So I went to my mom and, and dad and go, why didn't you tell me you love me? And I went to my mom first, she goes, well, I'm Korean. So I do not say what is known. I speak by action. Now I look at my dad and, he, and he's stubborn and black and he goes, well, if your mama ain't saying the shit, I ain't saying the shit either. <laughs> but I got kids, man, I got kids. I tell them I love them every single day, multiple times a day, that's right. because I don't want my kids to have that same story about me. But, but my parents are now grandparents and they're both over 70. You think they changed for my kids? No, no. 
I'm talking to my son the other day. He's five. Remember, he's only five. I'm like, hey, buddy, you're the best. You are the best. My mom walks by and goes, uh, how you know he the best? <laughs> Much too young to tell. <laughs> Why you keep lying to him? <laughs> it's a true, it's a true. <laughs> this is what I gotta deal with people. But that's the reason why I love my mom. She speaks her mind and she taught me that and that's why I'm a stand-up comedian because of my mom. That's right, with truth tells. That's right, that's right. Because my mom, you know, she was an immigrant. She had me just a year after she moved here, right? There was no internet at that time. She didn't have books or friends to learn how to be a mom. She did her best while my dad worked all day. But now, I'm learning things with my five-year-old son that my mom never taught me. I'm learning nursery rhymes for the first time with my son. Yeah, I just found out Mary didn't have a little ram. <laughs> Now, if you don't like that joke, fuck you. <laughs> My mom deserves that joke. She got so mad when she heard it. She was like, why you say that? I go, well, cause it's a true, it's a true. Thank you, Tippy. have a great night. Appreciate the love. Thank you, Tippy.